Now another part of your action research methodology is the data gathering methods. A focused research question with appropriate data gathering tools will lead to useful and reliable analysis. The kind of data and your method in gathering data will influence the result of your study. If your desired outcome, for example, is to let those learners and their frustration reading level move to instructional or independent reading level at the end of your study, how will you know that you are doing the right thing? How will you know that they have improved their reading abilities and to what extent? What specific indicator performance would tell you that you succeed? In finding answers, you have many options to choose from. Choosing the most appropriate methodology will eventually result in accurate, valid, reliable, and meaningful data. Keeping various sources of data in classroom helps provide a greater understanding of what is actually occurring in the classroom. Students' journals or diaries are good sources of data. These contain information on experiences, feelings, aspirations, insights, and personal lessons learned by them, which are possible sources of qualitative data. As a teacher researcher, you can collect meaningful information from your daily record of students' performance, attendance, or test scores. A student's portfolio is also a reliable source of data on their performance for you to evaluate and see if your goal is attained. It is also helpful if student respondents are collecting data on their own performance. Through this, students are becoming directly involved in monitoring their own progress which would eventually result in positive change. Documenting your data collection and even the entire research process will give you a record of implementation which can be a very good source of data for reflection. Taking videos, audio recordings, and photographs are only some of the ways you can document your process. This table shows the possible sources of data and this was adapted from Bruso 2011. Generally, there are two approaches in research methodology. First, qualitative, and second, quantitative. The approach that you will choose will depend on the research question that you seek to answer. Action research may use qualitative or quantitative only, but the use of the combination of qualitative and quantitative will lead to better results as it looks into the action research process in two or more perspectives. Okay, so let us discuss qualitative data collection method. Quantitative data collection method provide verbal information rather than numerical description. This is used with phenomena that are difficult or impossible to quantify mathematically such as beliefs, meanings, attributes, and symbols. This is used by the researcher to capture the student's experiences and the entire duration of the intervention. Qualitative methods give you deeper understanding of the feelings, views, opinions, thoughts of your respondents that may not be obtained quantitatively. The following are some action research qualitative methods. First, interview. An interview in qualitative research is a conversation where questions are asked to elicit information. Interviews help in gaining a clear understanding of people's thoughts, actions, and views. According to Glesney in 1992, an interview gives one opportunity to learn about those things that cannot be seen. There are several variations on interviews. Structured, semi-structured, and unstructured. Each variation can be utilized in different situations. If time is limited and you wish to increase the comparability of answers among respondents, then it would be best to use the structured interview. If you wish to have some flexibility but still cover key topics, then utilize semi-structured interview. 
If little is known about the topic and how to approach it, then an unstructured interview may allow you to explore the topic best. It is a must that you prepare your interview protocol or interview guide prior to the actual interview session. Most of the time, the interview is conducted among learners themselves. Always remember that your interviewee has something to contribute to your understanding of the research topic and having this mindset will allow you to establish rapport with your research participant and will keep you interested in what he or she will say. As the researcher who is the primary user of the information, you collect data directly from them on a one-on-one -on -one basis while keeping a friendly mode. You need to assure your learners that their responses will be kept confidential and not affect their grades and academic performance. Participants may provide data in their own words and in their own ways. They must also be assured that their ideas will count in your undertaking. Although an individual interview is time-consuming, it is a practical way to elicit a response from the learners because they are given privacy with you to express their true feelings. If you want to record the interview, you must inform your participants. They must also be assured on the anonymity and confidentiality of their responses. If you hope to use an interview as your method, be specific. Are you going to interview them individually or as a group? In the entire duration of your research, how many times will you conduct an interview? How will you choose your interviewee from among the identified participants? Will you just get a sample or the whole population? In your proposal, the answers to these basic questions must be clear to you when you decide to use interview as your data collection method. Now let me give you the following tips in conducting interviews as stated by Torneo and Torneo in 2018. First, inform the participants on the purpose of the interview. Explain how the session takes place. Second, assure research participants' anonymity and information confidentiality. Third, ask good questions. Fourth, let your participants lead. Basically, you need to create an atmosphere where your research participants will be interested about the topic so much that they will willingly share their insight about it. Once you have made your informant interested in sharing and opening up about himself or herself, try to keep it at this level of exchange. Second, focus group interviews. This is an alternative to individual interviews, most especially if the number of research participants is big that conducting one-on-one -on -one interview may not be practical given limited time. A focus group explores a topic through group discussion. The group is comprised of 6 to 10 participants selected as a representative of a class. The facilitator promotes discussion that will bring out information not tapped through a questionnaire or individual interviews. Third, observation. Observation, as the name implies, is a way of collecting data through observing. As a researcher, you immerse yourself in a natural setting of your respondents while observing, taking notes or even audio or video recording. Observation gives the researcher direct access to the main source of the information. The procedure and the instrument to be used in observation greatly depend on the research question to be answered. The quality of data can only be gathered using appropriate instruments. You may ask a co-teacher to observe your interaction with your respondents. However, she must be given an instrument that she knows how to use. In the case also that you want to back up your observation tool to capture every detail, you may audio tape or video record your class. 
Let's adapt the two-column notes by Hollingsworth in 2001 to 2005, as cited by Nogent et al. 2012. These two-column notes observation tool will capture what you observe in your identified respondents and what does those behavior mean to you as the researcher. You may also prepare a checklist containing your expected behavior to which you will just check if the desired behavior is manifested or not. This will ensure that you will gather meaningful information based on the presence or absence of the behavior as indicators of the effect of the action you employed in your research. The data as to the frequency of manifestation of behavior can be taken quantitatively to deepen the analysis of the result of the study. On the other hand, it is important to note that the observation data collection method may be associated with certain ethical issues. Fully informed consent of research participants is one of the basic ethical considerations to be adhered to by researchers. Fourth is document analysis. Numerous written documents of learners' performance are at easy reach of you as a teacher researcher. These are rich sources of data that would help you understand how your respondents perceive and react to the intervention you are implementing. This may include journals, diaries, artworks, letters, written stories, and the like. Information from these documents can be used to clarify learners' performance through observation, interview, and written objective assessments. Let's discuss quantitative methods. This refers to measurable data sets that you may get from the respondents, test scores, written responses, and graded performance using a set of criteria will tell you the extent of the changes your action impacted your respondents. Establishing a baseline data of performance before the start of the research in between assessment and conducting post-test or evaluation of performance will provide you clear basis in looking into the evidence of success. Increment in grades, improvement in reading ability level, and higher performance are just some of the actual data that would help you further understand the flow of your research. There are some quantitative research designs that are used by researchers in different fields. These objective research methods deal with numbers to describe the results of study. Among these research designs, experimental research is the most applicable in action research where an intervention or action is implemented in order to address a specific classroom issue or problem. Experimental research design uses instruments that yield numerical data. This employs the use of independent variable to see its effect on the dependent variable. Depending on the research question to be answered and the target respondents, the researcher may choose from among the three types of experimental research design, such as pre-experimental, quasi-experimental, and true experimental. Now let us discuss pre-experimental. In an action research, the independent variable or the intervention is initiated to see its effect to the behavior of the learners. However, in this type of experimental setup, randomization of sample is not applied. It has no control group also. For example, you will initiate a reading intervention in your class. All of the learners in that class are respondents and receive the same intervention. Or if you want to create a special class for your identified respondents, struggling readers for instance, the whole members of the special reading class will be part of the study. All of them will receive the same intervention and their performance shall be measured quantitatively. Quasi-experimental this involves the basic characteristics of experimental research design where the independent variable is manipulated to see its effect on the dependent variable. 
There is no random selection of participants, but there is a designated control group. While in true experimental, there is a control group, but participants are randomly selected. In a collaborative research involving two classes, this can be used where one class will be introduced with intervention, which becomes your experimental group, while the other class will be taught the usual way, and that is your control group. Among the three types of experimental design, pre-experimental and quasi-experimental are commonly used. This is because action research usually takes place in the classroom where grouping and randomization requires ethical considerations involving both the participant and non-participant members of the class. Data triangulation Action research problem is most of the time unique in every class. It is unique because each class is composed of learners with unique combination of traits and characteristics. That uniqueness of the phenomenon in your class would also entail a unique solution. It is in its premise that there is no single perfect data collection process that can be prescribed for you in order to end with reliable and valid data. However, the triangulation of data would aid you in looking into the consistency and accuracy of your analysis. Triangulation is a process of gathering multiple data through valid ways in order to ensure reliable results. Triangulation is further defined by Nogent et al. in 2012 as using at least three independent windows to observe any phenomenon which helps to ensure quality. Triangulation provides the following benefits. First, it compensates for the imperfection of data gathering tools. Second, when multiple techniques give the same results, it can increase confidence in the results. Third, when multiple resources fail to give the same results, it can raise follow-up questions. Another view of triangulation is presented by William Bruso in 2011. As illustrated in the diagram, there are three methods used in data collection. First, observation. This answers the questions, what do I see as a researcher? The second method is interviewing or journaling. What do my students tell me? And of course, the quantitative data process or method, assessments, and tests. This will answer the question, what does a student work tell me? This is an example of triangulating data for action research in reading. Observation notes on reading performance of identified struggling readers in a class. Second is review of reading journals and interview with the respondents. And another method to triangulate data is reading level of respondents as a result of reading assessment using tools.